presentation. This is my first attendance of this uh, very informative meeting. So I uh, work on Cardiolipin uh, remodeling, since it's remodeling for almost uh, 10 years, but I never joined such a condensed meeting. I learned more in one meeting than all the meetings I attended about Cardiolipin. So normally it takes me about 20 minutes to give us give an introduction to explain to people what is cardiolipin. Now I don't have to do that. I just need to show that my lab actually made some contribution by clone the, the first uh, lysol, um, phosphatidylglycerol acyltransferase. Um, we also joined with other labs, cloned the first human cardiolipin synthesis, and we cloned, um, we also demonstrated that cardiolipin synthesis has uh, remodeling activity, which um, has not been followed up. And most importantly, uh, the first acyl transferase involving uh, cardiolipin remodeling. So that's the focal point of my presentation today. And so we call the upper part as de novo and lower part as remodeling. So why should we bother? I mean, for me, why should I study cardiolipin remodeling? Um, you know, it, TAS is... Um, a gene that involves in um, very mutation in, in human bath syndrome, and and back in my career, I'm, I'm actually through my throughout my career, my major attention is focused on diabetes research. Um, so when we study diabetes, we have to ask the question, why we become diabetic? In the process, we learn a lot more actually from model organism like yeast and Dr. Greenberg's work and we follow and, 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 and others um, give us a lot of information about mitochondria dysfunction in lower organism. And from there, we learn the human model. <laughs> I, we would not call it model, but the rare human mutation like Bath syndrome teach us a lot about mitochondria dysfunction. So we... Um, since I work in different fields, you know, I would like to spend a few minutes to introduce you why I pay attention to cardiolipin remodeling. So, as you know, in this, this country, there's, there's three things you cannot avoid. <laughs> Life, death, and, and uh, tax. Um, so we're going to die. All of us are going to die. And hopefully we die, we live, live healthier life uh, before we die. And so why we die? Because we, we get old. And we get old doesn't kill us. It's the aging-related diseases that kill us. Um, so this famous guy, Dan M. Harmon, he uh, proposed uh, uh, mitochondria as the aging clock. He proposed this more than half a decade ago. He called the mitochondria uh, theory of aging. And his theory is uh, very simple. As we have, we have gone through the, this uh, entire two days, is that mitochondria is the origin of powerhouse, but at the same time produce free radical. Free radical is damaging to protein, to DNA, to phospholipid, and mitochondria itself. So this damaging process makes us from a beautiful looking little girl to this, um, you know, when we get old, uh, that's the aging process. This process actually accumulates and is like an aging clock and tickling. Okay. So why should I mention this? Well, cardiolipin remodeling actually has a lot to do with this whole process. We have learned all the good stuff about the cardiolipin remodeling so far. That's the tefacin. What I'm going to teach you today is completely the opposite, the ugly side of cardiolipin remodeling, but it's not the tefacin. Okay. So the disease that Related to the aging process is obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. That's the disease and cancer. And, but these three diseases combined, you know, 90% of us is going to you know, leave this world with uh, these three diseases. If you look at the common defect among the three diseases, they have very high level of reactive oxygen species. They have uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. The two are related and pathological cardio remodeling, cardiolipin remodeling. It's not the physiological cardiolipin remodeling that I pay attention, it's the, the pathological. Why we call it pathological? Well, let's learn some basics about cardiolipin again. <laughs> I, this is the only slide I bore you. I, I probably most of you already know. So cardiolipin is, because it's unique localization within the mitochondria, 
it's constantly bombarded with free radical because it's uh, dominated with a linoleic acid and some polyunsaturated fatty acid. The double bond is very sensitive to oxidative damage. So this damaging process, as it begin with an attack of free radical, and, and the shift, and eventually turn this one of the single chain, become free radical itself. It's called oxidized cardiolipin. These free radicals start coming back to attack the neighbor fatty acid chains. And this go on and on until all the four chains become oxidized. This whole process is called a lipid peroxidation. And the cardiolipin is the worst. Actually, there's a nature by a technology paper published a few years back that cardiolipin is the first one got oxidized and damaged during the oxidative stress process. So I study diabetes. So the first question I ask is, does it matter if you know, cardiolipin is your composition changes in, in diabetes or obesity or cardiovascular disease? The answer is yes. And thanks to the work of uh, Shannon Han, Richard Gross, and a few others, we begin to realize and appreciate that cardiolipin remodeling actually play a major role in all the aging-related related metabolic diseases. Not only in Bath, Bath syndrome is, is an inborn error, it's happening in young people. But we, I will come back. Why we study this can help Bath syndrome. So if you look at the diabetic mice, you see the changes are, are dramatic. So you, you, uh, during the onset of uh, STZ, Diabetic, uh, diabetes, which is type 1 diabetes, you see the enrichment of DHA cardiolipin and decrease of 16.1 and 18.2, that's the total linoleic uh, cardiolipin. The good, I call the good cardiolipin. Then in yeast, you don't have the DHA cardiolipin, but in human, you do have a DHA cardiolipin. I call the bad cardiolipin, just for the simplicity. So if you, if you treat type 2 diabetes, the same thing. You see the um, Linoleic content increases when you treat patients with uh, anti-diabetes drug, which improve insulin sensitivity, and that actually decreases the so-called bad cardiolipin. The DHA content decreases. And there are cardiovascular diseases. Um, you know, Dr. Um, um, Chico's la uh, lab and others and showed in cardiovascular disease you have the same thing. And so with aging, during the on onset of aging process, you see the same trend. So I always joke about diabetes. I said that you know, Mother Nature or God tell us that you are old because the reason is very simple. If you look at this picture. So this was published quite a few years ago. The, somebody studied the inverse relationship of mitochondria, DHA content, versus life, maximum lifespan. There's the inverse correlation of DHA content. So short-living uh, mammals like mouse, they have a very low DHA, uh, they have a very high DHA content. And, and the humans and the horses have very low. And the diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease does not become disease only when we, when we reach to middle age. So we are old. Just based on the DHA content, it will tell us we are old. So what that matters? Well, DHA actually is bad in cardiolipin. Um, that's the theory that, that I try to learn more about because it's already proven that the DHA content in cardiolipin is directly correlated with lipid peroxidation index. The higher DHA content, the easier the cardiolipin becomes oxidized. Oxidized cardiolipin is bad. How bad? Well, it's positively correlated with um, ROS production. Okay? So it's the ROS production level is negatively correlated with maximum lifespan. So that tells us that there's clearly evidence supporting that DHA content in cardiolipin is detrimental to our health. Now, so we have learned entire session of the, the two-day sessions about cardiolipin remodeling. What we have learned so far is the physiological I call the physiological cardio remodeling, cardiolipin remodeling, because if you knock out the test, it's lethal. It's supporting basic function, biological function. ML, MLCL AT, which um, in, you know, it's also supporting basic function because it's involved in fatty acid oxidation. 
So this is my working hypothesis. We believe that aging-related diseases produce ROS. ROS would uh, oxidize the cardiolipin. Cardiolipin has to be repaired through either pathological or physiological. The physiological repair process requires the two players, tapasin and MLCLAT. Well, the pathological one is the one that we paid attention, which is called acyl-CoA-dependent lysocardiolipin acyltransferase. This was, still is, the, the, um, well, the most efficient acyltransferase because it convert monolyso and dilysocardiolipin to cardiolipin with a very efficient um, um, uh, way. And oddly so, compared with tefacin and uh, MLCLAT, AOCAD1 doesn't have a preference to linoleic uh, uh, CoA, okay? It actually uses a mixture. Actually, I will show you in the overexpression cell line. It prefers a long polyunsaturated fatty acyl CoA. And that gets us into trouble when you, it's like you remodel this house, you, the window is damaged by a tornado, you, you put a wrong window, it becomes leaky. The problem is not fixed, and, and it will, we have to pay a price for that. When we clone this enzyme, we really know nothing about, I mean, I was just very, very naive, and back then, tefacin just being cloned, and I thought, well, this would be another tefacin, must be involving good function. So we look at the tissue distribution pattern first. It all express only in tissue that regulate the basal metabolic rate. That gives us some clue, because it's not in skeletal muscle that much. Actually, in diabetic case, it's induced. So that means somehow, this remodeling process regulates the basal metabolic rate. So what it does is, this I don't have to go through. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm still gonna show you that oxidized cardiolipin um, it's different from tefacin where it's uh, trans-isolation. The, the isolation process does require monolysocardiolipin. The damaged acyl chain will be hydrolyzed by unknown player. So, so far, we don't know who is, who is the, the phospholipase A2 that is responsible for this uh, hydrolysis. That produces a, a monolysocardiolipin. Monolysocardiolipin catalyzed by AOCAD form a cardiolipin. But pay attention to the acyl composition. Here, you don't see the tetralinoleal cardiolipin, but this is a long polyunsaturated. Make this molecule unstable. Now, we published this work 2004. Very few people pay attention to it because most people think, well, it's involving cardiolipin remodeling and it's not in the mitochondria. Who cares? It's actually turned out to be that mitochondria social membrane is the the, the hot spot for all the phospholipid remodeling. So we demonstrate that indeed, um, the, the ALCAT is localized in mitochondria, social membrane, is based on activity and the, um, the subcellular localization of the protein. So why, why, why I pay attention? Well, the first thing caused my attention is this enzyme is upregulated in all the aging-related diseases. And that's what causes me interest. So if you look at the diabetes, this is a normal diet, this is a high-fat diet. AOCAD is induced in every metabolic tissue. And this activity is upregulated by um, onset of diabetes and obesity. And it's directly uh, uh, induced by oxidative stress because here is isolated cardiomyocyte. AOCAD expression induced by threefold within four, four hour period of time. Now, what that means? So we generate a stable cell line. In, uh, we use a C2C12 skeletal myocyte. We generate a stable cell line that mimic the expression level in diabetic condition. It's about threefold increase, or less than threefold, twofold increase. Protein level is about 50%. What you see is change. Only thing you change, change is the acyl profile of a cardiolipin. You see the decrease of so-called good cardiolipin an increase of the bad ones, the total cardiolipin level also decreases in the C2C2 uh, skeletal myocyte cell line. We also generate knockout mice. And we look at all ACL profile of PE, PC, and the cardiolipin, and PG. The only thing that they change dramatically in the, in the heart is tetralinoleal cardiolipin, or tetralinoleic 
here are most people call it linolenic cardiolipin. It increased about uh, 50%. Nothing else changes. Okay. So I'm going to skip all the diabetes-related hardcore um, you know, data because that's not what we, we pay attention to here. Nevertheless, what I'm going to show you is that briefly, when you knock out this uh, pathological remodeling enzyme, what you see is all the benefit of young mice. The mice do not become overweight when they are fed with high-fat diet. They have, a, um, they have a lower fat mass. They have a higher lean mass, just like in the opposite to bad syndrome boys we, we saw yesterday. And they are, pre, they, are, they are immune. They are protected from diabetes because they, have, they handle glucose better, and they are uh, more insulin sensitive. That means they, they, they do not become diabetic. And they have improved the insulin sensitivity. This is our jargons. So diabetes, obesity, then look at the cardiovascular disease. That's what I'm going to focus today because I try to um, convince you that AOCAD may play a role in onset of cardiomyopathy in Bath syndrome. Why is that? Well, if we, we, don't, we don't have a good mouse model of cardiomyopathy. What we did was induce cardiomyopathy by giving mice uh, thyroid hormone. And, and um, Adam's work, um, just to show everything about T4, how, how damaging it is to mitochondria. Here is what happens if you give uh, too much T4. It causes a dilated cardiomyopathy. Surprisingly, if you knock out our gene, the, the dilated cardiomyopathy is gone because you, you can see this is um, the, the complication associated with um, dilated cardiomyopathy. This is the ventricle fibrosis. This is wild type. This is a knockout. It's completely gone. And if you look at the, um, the hypertrophic growth of a cardiomyocyte, you can see this is a vehicle. This is a T4. This is a control mice. The, the, the size is bigger. If you knock out the ALCAD, they... they Pretty much the same, it remains the same. But if you compare here and here, the cell here are much bigger. And all the, all the markers related uh, dilated cardiomyopathy being corrected when you knock out AOCAD. And also biomarkers, it's all corrected. Don't have to go through each one of them. Now, the interesting thing is we must ask the question why? I mean, it looks like here you have a cardiolipin remodeling enzyme. It's changing the acyl composition. It's not depleting cardiolipin, but make a, you know, when you knock it out, it make mice much healthier. So here comes the second milestone person. That's uh, Douglas Wallace. He, he actually carried on the theory from um, Dan M. Hammond. He believed the mitochondria aging clock is really about oxidative stress. He believed that oxidative stress uh, with damage uh, mitochondria, uh, well, damage DNA protein phospholipid causes a mitochondria DNA point mutation. Those mutations will accumulate eventually. You know, by the time we are middle age, half of our mitochondria is dysfunctional, and we, we reach to 70 year or older, you know, you know, very few mitochondria remain functional. That's because accumulated damage from oxidative stress. So let's look at oxidative stress when you overexpress uh, AOCAT. It does everything what tefacin deficiency does. You can see that the, um, when you overexpress AOCAT, the protein level is about 50%. You see an increase in the TBAS, which is a lipid peroxidation product. And if you treated the culture of the cell with uh, oxidative stress, you exacerbate it. And this is a life profile. You can monitor it. And this, is, this is a time as time going on. The, uh, the cell just produces tons of oxidative stress. And in the knockout mice, you see the opposite. So this is the wild type of control. This is a vehicle without any treatment. You see a significant decrease in the lipid peroxidation in the mice, cardiomyocyte. And in the T4 treated mice, you see even more difference because the wild type have become. Um, I mean, they, they, they accumulate a lot, lot of oxidative stress because the uh, dysfunctional mitochondria caused by uh, T4. And here is the profile of the mitochondria DNA depletion. So basically, if you uh, overexpress uh, this enzyme, it causes mitochondria mutation and depletion. And this is knockout mice, you see a decrease in lipid peroxidation. So we, 
we we were very lucky actually with the department support. We were the one of the first top ten people, a uh, top ten uh, first first ten ten lab bought this toy, this uh, seahorse. And to this day, we're still scared about this machine because it's very fussy to use about primary side, uh, isolated primary tissue. But nevertheless, we show the same thing as what uh, Dr. Pu, right? You show that in the um, Tefacin mutant uh, cell line, you see a higher basal oxygen consumption rate. That's what happens in our cell line. The reason is because this, um, the mitochondria is leaky. When you give uh, oligomycin, the ALCAD overexpressing cell line consume more oxygen. And this is the proof when you use this machine, you can profile it by add, um, first you add the uh, complex one uh, oligomycin to, to inhibit the uh, ATP synthesis. The uh, uh, oxygen consumption rate of the control cell line dropped to very low level, while in comparison, the ALCAD overexpression level cell line still consume more oxygen. That's because they are leaky. And now let's zoom in about what's going on with, with mitochondria. What you see is in the control cell line, you see orderly mitochondrial structure. If you look at the AOCAT overexpression cell line, this is C2C cell cells, you see dilated ER, you see mitochondria death, you see swelling, and this is correlated with uh, depletion of mitochondrial copy number and increased uh, mitochondrial mutation rate. If you knock it out from the mice, you see the opposite. This is the um, section of skeletal, mice, uh, skeletal muscle. You see the improvement of mitochondrial DNA stability or fidelity. You see copy number go up. You can see clearly in the knockout, you see more mitochondria thicker and healthier. And their mutation rate go down. And now, why this? going on. So I'm fortunate to know all the important people in the right time. So just by then, I know a collaborator. His name is uh, Orion Shinruhai, who published a seminal paper in 2008. He showed that the mitochondria go through cycles of fusion and fission. And, and most of you probably know the process, but I want to make this a, a story, mainly because this is very important. You explain the phenotype of our mice as well as the cell line. So mitochondria is like our humans. The, the two mitochondria like each other it must be healthy. The, only the healthy mitochondria like each other, the, they fuse. Like a two person, two good person married, and then they produce young. And the fission is like the producing young, so the, the, the um, split again become two mitochondria. However, if one mitochondria is sick and another mitochondria is healthy, they don't get married because I don't like you. You're a bad guy. So that, that mitochondria is a damaged mitochondria and become a bachelor. The bachelor mitochondria better go through, you know, Bible study, whatever, become a good guy and come back to get married again. If not, this mitochondria will become, go to the death camp, become bachelor forever, not only bachelor forever, but also being eaten up goes through a process called autophagy, mitochondrial autophagy. Okay. So can we use this to explain the phenotype of our mice? The answer is yes. So if you look at the overexpression cell line, you can see mitochondrial fragmentation. This happened to Dr. Zhang's presentation. When you uh, have a, a mitochondrial a phospholipid deficiency, you see mitochondrial uh, fragmentation. And this fragmentation is caused by mitochondrial swelling. The mitochondria, this is a big bachelor mitochondria. Well, it, it cannot marry because it's, 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 it have a, have a fusion problem. So you see the mitochondria is very big when you overexpress AOCAD. And the reason is because there's a fusion defect. The fusion defect is caused by deficiency of key players involved in mitochondrial fusion. The go-between guys, there are two. It's called the mitochondrial fusion one, mitochondrial fusion two. They are depleted when you overexpress ALCAT. And if you knock, knock out the ALCAT, their level go back up, they're actually higher. So can we show that the, the fusion, there's a fusion, is there a fusion defect? If, you, if so, you can, can, you, can, you, can you demonstrate it? So this is what we, we demonstrated. We can label mitochondria with mitochondria-targeted uh, green fluorescence, red fluorescence, and you can, you can fuse them, they become yellow, and this is the normal healthy um, vector control cell. 
And if you overexpress our enzyme, the fusion no longer happens. You can see the, the green, red, and they remain separate after they fuse. And if you overexpress MFN2, which is the one that, that facilitates fusion, which is depleted by AOCAT, now you see a normal fusion come back. And we, we profile all the players that regulate infusion. The MFN1 could do similar work. This is uh, the wild type uh, cell. This is a uh, uh, fragmented mitochondria. This is after you transfect back MFN1 or MFN2, you rescue, but not OPA1. OPA1 is localized in the mitochondria membrane, while AOCAD is in the mitochondria associate membrane. So I think that's where, I think AOCAD regularly outer mitochondria membrane fusion. Got to speed up because it's late in the afternoon. So what happens if you knock out AOCAD? Would the cell be more resistant to mitochondria fragmentation induced by free radical? The answer is yes. So if you, if you treat a wild type of isolated MAP cell um, with free radical, you see complete fragmentation. But if you treat the knockout uh, MAP cells with the uh, same dose of free radical, they remain healthy. They don't become fragmented. So come back to this, this, this cycle. So we, we demonstrate there's a fusion problem um, when we overexpress ALCAT. How about um, autophagy? What happens if uh, the mitochondria cannot fuse? I mean, they have to be cleared away by autophagy. So that's what happened when, you, when we look at the um, hyperthyroid uh, induced cardiomyopathy. So this is a heart tissue. When we section the heart tissue, we look at the mitochondria. It's loaded with dead mitochondria. It cannot be cleared away because, because autophagy probably is a defect. This is the, the knockout mice. This is a wild type of control mice. You can see day and night difference that you have a lot of dead mitochondria cannot be cleared away. And when we profile for autophagy, the answer is yes. You can see that in the uh, wild type controls, you see a lot of uh, accumulation of, um, of um, uh, dead mitochondria, mainly because you, you see, uh, um, let's say, yeah, you see a depletion of... Um, or pink one in the, during the onset of uh, cardiomyopathy because pink one, I didn't bring in pink one, I need to say a few words. Pink one is another key player that is a kinase that required for mitochondria autophagy. So when you, when you, um, when you treat it with T4, you see the um, autophagy being upregulated, indicated by LC3 expression. In the knockout, you see um, this, is, this is not a big deal because you don't have a much oxidative stress. And more so is that you see the um, pink one level is, is very high. That means the, the mitochondria is not under stress. They, they don't need to work very hard. Um, I left out a, a liver mitophagy picture, actually. In the liver, you see a very similar thing. In, during the onset of obesity, um, there's impaired autophagy in the liver. And that impairment is completely gone in our knockout mice. So here is uh, my working model. So um, we believe that you know, aging-related diseases produce a lot of ROS, including um, you know, uh, bad syndrome people, that produce a lot of ROS. ROS would induce AOCAT expression. And this in induction um, makes the um, remodeling process go weary, mainly because uh, AOCAT catalyzes the synthesis of cardiolipin that is uh, depleted with uh, tetralanoleal cardiolipin. And that depletion causes the enrichment of DHA. DHA is very sensitive to lipid peroxidation. So you, go, you, you um, dramatically increase the, the cardiolipin peroxidation. This peroxidized cardiolipin itself is a free radical. It feeds back to itself, and then further damage uh, mitochondrial cardiolipin. And this vicious cycle goes on until mitochondria become dysfunctional. So because in Tafasin uh, mutant and, and also in bad patient, there is a, there's a huge level of oxidative stress, and also there's a depletion of uh, the tetralanoleal cardiolipin. It is hopeful if we could develop inhibitor of ALCAD, this is like a knock it out, 
you would be able to reverse depletion, hopefully, the tetralanolyl catalepin in type in patient. And you could also reduce the oxidative stress level because I show you that if you knock out AOCAD, the oxidative stress level and, and mitophagy level go very low. And I have a little lab divided by two projects because we, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction is half of it. Uh, the person who did most of the work is a graduate student. Um, part of the work actually already published um, in cell metabolism and PNS. And we have a few more come up. And we have collaborators, um, David Chen, who is the mitochondria expert at Caltech. We have Orian Shinrenkai. Um, we have Xianling Han for the uh, lipidomics, and Grant um, provided some help to our work and, and uh, other collaborators. Our work is uh, funded by NIH and, and um, ADA. And thank you very much for hanging on for me last, <laughs> for the late afternoon. Uh, Questions. So, what what is the evolutionary uh, advantage for the organ the, to keep this uh, the enzyme that's only do bad things? Uh. Yeah. Well, I the, each time when I um, um, give a seminar, this is the question that show up again and again. I can only make an analogy about all the bad things happen in our life: oncogenes, uh, insulin resistance, steroid hormone. Those are bad things. We kept them because they have a basic biological function. The basic biological function of AOCAD is, is fine-tuning free radical production. Free radical itself is required as a signal molecule for you know, immunity, whatever you can call it. This enzyme is very sneaky in the sense, well, I have, I have a... I could spend hours to talk about this enzyme. We know a lot more because this is the question we ask very often, why we need to keep such a bad guy? Under normal situation, this enzyme does not express much at all. Scarily, very little. We just recently got some monoclonal antibody from a collaborator in Japan. We scan normal human tissue, the, the expression, level, expression level very low. But if you have a diabetes, if a cardiovascular disease, if you have a cancer, we haven't screened neurodegeneration. As long as you have oxidative stress, this enzyme start expressing itself because there's multiple levels of, of regulation, both as a transcriptional level, translational level, post-translational level. I don't have time to go detail. So Mother Nature is very smart. So this is the wrong way train. Only when you reach beyond your reproductive age, you're already passing your gene, and you know, when you are 50 or year older, your so whole system become dysfunctional. You have accumulated so much of oxidative stress, you just turn on this bad guy. Okay. Normally, it's doing good thing for us, I believe. Uh, so, remind what was the membrane potential like in your Alcat when knockouts? Oh, good question. Um, in the knockout, we never measure the mitochondrial membrane potential in the um, MEF cell, but in the overexpression cell line, they have a very high membrane potential. Actually, I, I left probably you know, dozens of slides because that's all related with diabetes. What we, we do measure the mitochondria um, potential, complex one activity, complex two, all those. Um, it basically mimic a very inefficient system. The cell could not produce enough ATP because the, the mitochondria is very uh, inefficient. It consumes a lot of more oxygen. That's why the basal level, when we first measured it, I was frightened by it. I said, why is the cell sitting in the cultural dish? I do mini marathon. I run, you know, consume oxygen and, you know, eat more food. That's understandable. But here is the cell line sitting in petri dish, consume 50% more of oxygen. It's precisely because it's doing so much waste. And also the acidification rate go up. So the students in my lab always say, complain, say, hey, Dr. Shi, you see the, our AOCAD overexpression cell line, within day two, the medium turned yellow because it, it turned on the glycolytic pathway to compensate lack of uh, oxidative pathway. So I would, I, would, I would go back and look just because of the striking pink one uh, association, right? Yes, because, yeah. um, you know, Richard Yule's group has shown quite nicely that uh -huh. pink one is normally associated or 
expressed at low levels because it's imported in one pathway mm -hmm. and constitutively degraded. Uh -huh. But when you have uh, effects on the membrane potential that, yeah. that decrease, you get a regulated proteolysis that somehow gets it to appear on the outer membrane. Uh -huh. So these would be things that would be interesting to look at in your knockout uh, cells to see where pink one is uh -huh. on your mitochondria. Yeah. Um, it, it might start to yeah. tease out a little bit of a mechanism. Yeah. That's a very good, good suggestion. Actually, I have uh, um, plans beyond that. Um, you know, it, I have uh, people who join my seminar say, hey, this is a beautiful model to study neurodegeneration. Because when we get older, our brain becomes um, degenerative. In a sense, the first marker for brain degeneration, neurodegeneration, is pink one level go down, slowly down, down. Actually, a young person with pink one mutation would develop early early onset of Parkinson's. And our mice actually, knock on mice, are very tricky, very smart. In a sense, I can tell you that they, pl they like to play trick with you. Like when we train the mice to do exercise, the mice always try to play. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the wild type control mice is very dumb, just running, keep running. Our knock on mice run, and as minute that he can get away from it, it will stop running. But he has a lot of energy. I mean, he can run all, all the time. Yeah. I, I still have uh, some issues with the. I, I still have some issues with the actual central aspect of your hypothesis, uh -huh. uh, which is that LCAT is a cardiolipin remodeling enzyme, mm -hmm. because if you knock it out, cardiolipin remodeling goes Go on nicely. Yeah. And um, if you overexpress it, of course, all hell breaks loose, but that's true for a lot of proteins. Mm -hmm. So my, my, real, my question is really, are you sure that this enzyme catalyzes only the, um, um, the, the acylation of monolyzer cardiolipin? Because you, data of the initial data from your lab, at least mm -hmm. to me, weren't very convincing. Mm -hmm. Then later on, you published uh, data that actually showed whether the enzyme can uh, also catalyze other uh, or can use other substrates. Mm -hmm. I think one really has to take a purified enzyme in this day and age that shouldn't be all that difficult anymore, mm -hmm. and see what its substrate specificity is. Because I'm convinced it's an interesting enzyme. Mm -hmm. I just don't know whether we really have understood. Uh, it, what it really does, and whether LCAT is actually an appropriate name. Hmm. Good question. Um, I would like to uh, share with you why we um, share the same concern. From the very beginning, we share the same concern because when you do a... Tefacin in vitro could remodel other phospholipid. That's what you, you demonstrated. So in vivo... How could you nail down that this is the thing that do all the trick? That's why we collaborated with Shining Heinz Lab. Every step we do, we do lipidomics. And so far, the most convincing change is always in the mitochondria. Based on all the data we try to, to see, is the mitochondria phospholipid is changed. In the heart, it's primarily cardiolipin. In um, liver, somehow it's it's a PG, because a PG and the cardiolipin share very similar structure. So I share with you a concern. That's why we're very cautious all along. Um, by sending every stage, we send a sample to profile all the phospholipid and, and neutral lipid. So far, only thing come back is the cardiolipin. We have another uh, major story that, that require, once again, profiling of a cardiolipin in different tissue, this time in the testis. And, and uh, we show, once again, the only changes is in cardiolipin. So I could not, I mean, just like we went a long way. When we begin with very naive thinking, this, this would be another tefacin because it's a good cardiolipin remodeling, supposed to be good for us. And the more we learn about it, the more confused we are. So we reversed it, then everything becomes so clear. I can tell you, that the mice is as healthy as you can imagine. And if it is an enzyme that involves in many aspects of um, basic biology, it's either lethal or becoming very sick. But so far, those, enzyme, uh, those, those mice are very healthy. Right. Yeah. Um, your uh, theory about the, the Barth uh, syndrome 
situation. Uh-huh. Uh, you you said that um, if you have less uh, desaturated uh, fatty acids, uh, I, you would expect that if LCAT1 activity is high, what you were saying, then there would be DHA in cardiolipin. And, well, that's not something we see. So I don't agree with you that inhibiting LCAT1 would be beneficial, or at least I don't expect it to be beneficial if you uh, try to solve the, the, the cardiolipin uh, problem there. It's possible that, um, that, that AOCAT is not played a role, but that's under the assumption that we have taken care of oxidative stress if you think about yeah, oxidative I'm, stress... I'm also not convinced that there are, there's a lot of oxidative stress in bar syndrome. So. In bar syndrome, there's no oxidative stress? I thought from yeast all the way to... Oh, well, th- there's a lot of, of, of contradictory data about oxidative stress in bar syndrome, but I still have to see the, the very uh, definite proof that that is indeed contributing to the, the pathogenesis. Yeah. When, uh, let, me, let me put your question in a different perspective. Okay. So... Where is all the long polyunsaturated fatty acid gone? Do you have a clue why it's gone? Which which would the, the in bad syndrome? Lino, why acid? the polyunsaturated fatty acid is gone? Polyunsaturated DHA, you know, arachidonic. Where where are they? Why are they are gone? In 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 bar syndrome, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I mean in other. Lipids, if you cannot or, answer or that degrade, question, degrade it. You can just degrade it. So. Yeah, why they are degraded? What, what would degrade polyunsaturated fatty acid? Be the oxidation. Oxidative stress. And you just don't see it because with the lipidomics, it's very hard to capture oxidized phospholipid because they are so unstable. It, oxidized cardiolipin or phospholipid would take no minute to be hydrolyzed because they're very detrimental to the cell. The total, you mean the phospholipid, or you mean the, the triglyceride? Well, anyway, we haven't looked at triglycerides, but, okay. but in general, I make the total content of, so, the, so there's no question about degradation, it's a question of distribution, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Okay. Two more questions. And actually, I think your theory, depend, your theory depends on the fact about the 50-year-old, your enzyme goes up, especially in cancer, in mm-hmm. cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. Another fact is, in, through your enzyme, the DHA, uh, HD, no, increase, you know, polyunsaturated fatty acid in cardiolipin increase. But the thing is, IL-4 uh, cardiolipin still unsaturated cardiolipin, still suffer from oxidative stress. Same thing, still unsaturated, still bad. Not good as saturated fatty acid cardiolipin. So, sure. so you said L four cardiolipin is good, uh, DHA cardiolipin is bad. Just two enzyme reason. But the thing is, L four cardiolipin unsaturated, still bad, still suffer from oxidative stress. Not as much as uh, if you feed a cell. This is not my work. I have to respect other people, there's tons of publication that if you feed the cell with DHA, you have a very high level of oxidative stress. Okay. That's already proven. Yeah. Because of bomb. I'm sorry? Because of bomb. Because yeah, because of the oxidative. Yeah. That's, that's what the AOCAT, that's, that's, so far we can only be certain that how AOCAT could cause oxidative stress is by remodel the cardiolipin full of polyunsaturated fatty acid. Those polyunsaturated fatty acids are far more sensitive to oxidative stress, and they trigger this chain event. It's called lipid peroxidation. And, and I, yeah, I, I welcome any feedback that prove me I'm wrong, because this is the field unfolding. If we answer this question, we are a lot better off in understanding mitochondrial dysfunction in aging and aging-related diseases, and hopefully would benefit the bath syndrome as well because this is, we are in the same group. One last question. Uh, I have two parts of the question. One is uh, what regulates LCAT levels and the enzyme activity uh, and what happens to this regulation with age? As you, as you say that you know, the LCAT is good for you, 
in like you know ROS is good for you. So what happens to this regulation over over a period of time or with age? We didn't we didn't do a systematic um, aging analysis because uh, we must uh, um, uh, do that someday. Is by you know analyze ALK level if we could collect tissue samples from newborn to all the way to you know in humans all the way to somebody live beyond a hundred years to see whether there is a trend. But I can tell you we we have a paper that 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 is almost um, done that. It, AOCAD not only regulate um, the oxidative stress level and, and AOCAD probably involved in the aging process, it definitely involved in the, at the cellular level, senescence. So we monitor how cell become old. So you isolate the MEF cell. Normally your MEF cell will grow five passages. That's it. But, it. but in our knockout my cell line, we see cell dividing, dividing, they grow, Precisely four generations longer. Four, that's on average is about, so if, if we live 70 year old and, and we extend by, by another 60%, I think we're going to live over 100 year old. So that's what our MEF cell is telling us. Our MEF cell can compare with wild type control MEF cell, which, you know, grow five generations, they go senescence. They all can knock out. MEF cell grow four more generations. And we always run out of the control MEF cells. My students said, well, why the cell grow so little? It's gone. I said, you know, there's some interesting issue involved. Then we look at the ALCAT level during senescence. It's sure enough at the cellular level, it, it pick up. Thanks you know, so those kind of things make me um, sleepless. I said, my God, we may find <laughs> something that keep us younger. Yeah.